Hey friends, it's Jacqueline for Pixie Dust PhD. This is part two of our month 24 creator update, and we already covered all the stats and analytics, so if that's what you like for the monthly creator updates, go check out part one. I will leave a link to that video in the description down below. In part one, we also covered about a third, maybe closer to half of the questions you guys asked me. Those were all just sort of about me and Adam and our lives and nothing particular to Disney or the channel. In this part two video, we will be doing the answers to your questions pertaining to Disney parks and Disney vacation clubs. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. Let's begin with those questions pertaining to Disney parks. Tara asked, what's one Disney park I've never visited that I would love to? Honestly, I've only been to the parks in America, so there's many that I would love to visit. I think my number one though would definitely be the parks in Tokyo. I just want to go to Japan a ton in general, but also those theme parks look immaculate. Outside of Disney World and Disneyland, I think that our next Disney park will be Disneyland Paris. Adam and I have been trying to get to Paris since 2020. We started planning a trip in 2019 for 2020 that we obviously didn't go on. And luckily we didn't have anything booked, so it wasn't a big deal. Nothing financially was a problem, just our dreams got crushed. Um, and then in 2020, we decided, oh, let's skip 2021, you know, things might still be dicey. So we did our long Walt Disney World trip instead. And we were hoping to get there in 2022 this year. Things still seem sort of dicey. I will admit that um, this is more coming from me being anxious about not being able to get home if something happens, like if France locks down or whatever, <laughs> while we're there. And I fully admit that that is not like fully ingrained in actual logic. That 100% is my clinical anxiety, which does not play by the rules of logic. So yeah, I don't know when we're getting to Paris. Uh, we're loosely looking at maybe trying to go this fall, but I'm not really getting my hopes up. And yeah, but at some point we'll get to Paris <laughs> and then we'll go to Disneyland Paris next probably. We are both under the assumption that at some point we will be living on the West Coast for a chunk of years. And so we're saving our travel to Asia for when we live on the West Coast and we're trying to tackle Europe while we live on the East Coast. It saves you a literal whole country of the US of flying time and cost. So yeah, that's why Japan's not coming sooner. Tim asked, what would my dream fifth park be? And what a question, and I've never thought of that. I know a lot of people want a villains park, I am not particular to villains. I think this whole, especially on Star Wars, like the amount of people that love the Star Wars villains, I think it's really interesting because like, aren't you supposed to not like them? Like they're the bad guys. But yeah, if a villains park meant that there would be more thrilling rides, I would be so down for it. I love proper roller coasters and I don't think Disney is really ever gonna venture into that territory. But if they wanted to, if they wanted to open a fifth park that had way more actual roller coasters, I would be there so fast. My real dream park would never freaking happen because it would just, you'd have to redo all of Disney World, but I would love a proper Pixar themed gate. So rather than have it like sprinkled, sometimes well, sometimes kind of weirdly throughout the other parks, have a park dedicated to Pixar. I would love to see the shorts incorporated more. I think those have a lot of heart and soul and wonderful theming. And also, I think this is actually a fairly popular notion, but for 20 years now, I've wanted to see a coaster from Monsters, Inc. of the door factory, like when Randall's chasing Boo and they're in that back part with all the doors on the tracks and it looks so thrilling. Frankly, I think you could just retheme Rock and Roller Coaster to that. That would be awesome, but a proper door coaster belongs in a Pixar park, if you ask me. What all would you want to see for a fifth gate at Disney World? I'm genuinely curious. I'm not the most creative person when it comes to like, here's a blank slate, come up with something. I'm much better at, here's an idea, why don't you edit, refine it, strengths and weaknesses. <laughs> so this is not my strength is, you know, what's my dream fifth park, but I would love to hear what you guys think. Let me know in the comments down below. Jonna asked if we would ever consider a Disney World resort only stay. And if yes, where would that be? And also if yes, like where would you not want to stay? That's such a good question. And I think in general, yes, I would consider it. In my current life constraints where the amount of annual leave or paid time off I get from my job is like my main factor of not going on vacation more. Mm, if I'm going to be down in Disney World, I probably want to go to the parks at least one or two days. So far in our Disney World vacations, I think we have had a ticket for literally every non like airport day that we've been there. Now that we're DVC owners though, I do anticipate that may change a little bit. 
a resort only stay in principle, I think sounds really nice. I just also know my brain and I think it would be so hard for me to be so close to the parks and like not be able to go in. If we did it though, I think like the Polynesian would be a great place because Adam and I just love the food, the drinks, the atmosphere there. Although again, I would be looking at Magic Kingdom and being sad probably, but I don't know. I mean, give me enough Lapu Lapus and I'll have no cares in the world. I also think some of the off-property hotels would be really fantastic, like the Waldorf Astoria looks like a great place to just hang out for a couple days and relax. Places I would not want to do a resort only stay in, this will sound incredibly uppity, but I don't think any of the value resorts, I don't think I'd want to be hanging out there <laughs> for most of the day. I mean, the big blue pool looks pretty cool, I'm not that much of a pool person, and you can't really walk anywhere. I guess you can take the Skyliner to some places. I don't know, it's just like not really my vibe, I don't think, for hanging out. But otherwise, I think staycation at Port Orleans could be fun, Caribbean Beach looks fun. Most of the deluxes though, definitely for me, like, I don't want to hate on any of them. They're definitely all very nice, but just for my personal tastes, I don't think I'd want to do like Old Key West or Saratoga Springs. I probably would not want to do Riviera either, um, but I'm less sure about that one. Animal Kingdom Lodge could be great because you have the savanna, so I could just like hang out with the animals all day and I'd be very happy about that. I also think those pools are nice and the food options are great, so that's probably a good one for a staycation. A lot of people also love the Wilderness Lodge and I don't dislike it by any means, but I don't know that there is enough stimulus there for me for a staycation for me, for like what I like to do. So it is very lovely, but I'm not sure I would want to like pay that much money or that many DVC points just to hang out in the hotel. That's probably also how I feel about Grand Floridian. It's just not really my style. And yeah, you can actually properly shop there, but we could stay at the Polynesian and just like monorail over and do that instead. I don't think a proper staycation is in our near future at the Disney resorts, but if we did do it, I definitely feel like the Polynesian is the front runner for me personally. Many people asked me if we were planning to move down to Florida to be closer to Disney World or if we would ever do that, some, something along those lines. My general answer is our moves are based on our careers. So I moved from the Seattle area out to North Carolina to get my PhD, and then we moved from North Carolina up to DC for my career. Our next move will be based on Adam's career, so he has should have been up for a promotion to an external sort of important role for a few years now. We've gotten pretty unlucky with his companies being part of mergers and acquisitions and his career timeline being stalled because of that, which we're going through right now, most likely, but whatever. Anyway, the point is Adam should be up for a promotion sometime, hopefully soon. And the industry he's in means that that role would cover a certain territory and so we would have to physically locate to that territory. If that territory happens to be Florida, then we're moving to Florida. If it happens to be Ohio, we're moving to Ohio. Like, we, I am very much of the opinion that we can live anywhere for a couple of years, even if it's not somewhere I necessarily want to be, but you know, we can do it. So we'll make the move we need to make for Adam to advance his career. If that happens to be Central Florida, I think it's obviously a huge perk, but I guess the overall answer is no, we're not like actively trying to move to Florida. Central Florida actually probably would not be very great for me career-wise, but I can probably pivot if needed, but it's just not a big goal. I mean, I love going to the parks, but the rest of Florida like doesn't appeal to me that much. Don't get me wrong when it's, you know, literally 19 degrees here and it's 70 degrees in Florida, suddenly I'm like, dang, I wish I lived in Florida. I think most of us feel that way in colder climates, but the summers there are pretty miserable. We do also have a very, very fluffy dog and literally she's not supposed to be outside if it's over like 80 degrees for more than 10 minutes. So a climate like that probably wouldn't be great for our dog. But yeah, if we end up in Florida and it benefits probably Adam's career, not necessarily mine, but you know, there's give and takes in relationships. I think that'd be fun. I've got some friends down there. It would be awesome to be closer to them all the time. Like just to be able to pop over and hang out and watch sports sounds fantastic, but it's just not a goal. It's not something we're actively trying to do by any means, but who knows? Uh, who knows where the wind will take us? And our last Disney Parks question came from Jonna, and it will segue really nicely into the Disney Vacation Club section of this question and answer video. But that is, how far in advance do you usually start planning a Walt Disney World trip, and are you usually only planning one at a time or several? 
Typically, I'd say I start sketching out a trip about a year to a year and a half in advance. And this is just very loose, like Adam and I talking about roughly, do you think you want to go in January? Do you think you want to go in September? And then as we get closer to that year mark, now that we are Disney Vacation Club owners, we start to actually pick out dates that seem feasible based on like work conflicts we know exist. With Disney Vacation Club, you do have that 11 month booking window for your home resort. And we intend to make good use of that first dibs. Before we owned Disney Vacation Club, I was probably planning trips about eight or nine months in advance. I think this just speaks to how type A I am. And also because I do have, and even in grad school, I had several like work commitments that I knew about a year plus in advance. So I had things I needed to work around and it would be obvious like in grad school, like May, like traveling during May was always going to be heinous. So if we wanted to go on a trip, it was usually going to be in the summer instead, like after those big things. So as much as it is important now that we are Disney Vacation Club owners to plan our Disney World trips at least 11 months in advance, I just sort of have always tended to planning trips, you know, eight to nine months, like a little further in advance than most people. I think this is just my type A personality, some of my anxiety coming through about just like wanting to get things settled and done. Moving on to Disney Vacation Club questions then. First, Amy asked if there were any surprises we learned about DVC during our first DVC trip. Specifically, was there anything different than we expected? And were there differences compared to staying on property, but not DVC? Amy has their first DVC stay coming up in a few months. So congrats, Amy, I am really happy for you. Our first DVC stay, we rented points. And so when you rent points and it varies depending on which broker you use, but the one we did, and I think most of them, it's pretty much like non-refundable. You can't cancel. <laughs> so you end up paying, you know, half now, half later, or sometimes all now, again, it depends, but it's over a thousand dollars if you're staying for several nights, at least. I think we ended up paying around $1,600, maybe a little more, and we were staying for a little under a week. And th this is a lot of money. It's a lot of money to put down uh, that you can't cancel. So I am very proficient at booking hotel rates that are refundable and checking them frequently to see if it goes down, rebooking, canceling, etc. With renting DVC points, that does not work out for you. Because it was such a huge sum of money that I couldn't get back if we changed our minds, I did a lot, a lot, a lot of intense reading and researching about Disney Vacation Club. So I would say no, I don't think there were any surprises for us because I had put in a lot of hours to understanding what it meant to rent DVC points and do a DVC stay. There are differences compared to other on-property stays. The big one, I guess, is housekeeping is very different. And also, of course, your rooms are different. Qualitatively and anecdotally, something I hear often from folks doing DVC that don't maybe do as much research into it before they book is a lot of people are surprised that you only get one proper bed. So rooms will sleep four or five, but you only get like one queen bed. And then it's like a pullout couch. I think most people are accustomed to receiving two double beds or two queen beds in hotels. And DVC is very different at that studio level. I think you only get two proper beds at Old Key West. Everything else is one bed and the couch. And then even in one bedrooms, for the most part, I don't have it memorized, but I think most of them, again, it's you get one actual bed in a bedroom and then there's a living room with a pullout couch that you can convert into the second bed. Because for the most part, we're only traveling the two of us and Adam and I share a bed. Only having one bed doesn't matter. Like we sleep in that bed and it's fine. But yeah, I would say the reduced housekeeping and the bed setup can surprise some people and some people really dislike that. If you are bringing your own car or renting a car though, you do get free parking when you're staying on DVC points. So I think that's a great perk. The other thing I'll say I see some complaints about and honestly isn't my favorite is that the studios come with disposables for your kitchenette. So plastic cutlery and like disposable bowls and plates. So if you're staying in the same studio for like a week and you only get four plates, four bowls, like <laughs> you can't do that much with four paper bowls, right? If you're having cereal in the morning, you're pouring milk in it. It's pretty much toast right away. I wish that they would just put actual dishware in there, but I guess because there's no dishwasher, they think it's less feasible. I don't know. I don't know the reasoning, but I will say that can be annoying if you're not changing rooms. But I guess that's then on the flip side, the benefit of doing a split stay where you're moving rooms, because <laughs> then you get refreshed kitchenette supplies and refreshed towels without, you know, having to pay for extra housekeeping or whatever. Overall, DVC is a timeshare. And I think some people forget that and expect like the hotel service situation. That's just not really how timeshares work for the most part. Amelia asked if we have any desire to purchase additional DVC points or wish we had purchased a different or larger contract to begin with. 
I am very happy with Bay Lake Tower as our home resort, and I think that the 90 points is working out pretty well for us. Because we really only go for an extended period of time every other year between banking and borrowing points, like 90 points plus banked or borrowed points can be quite a lot of points for studio stays at least. Overall, at least right now, I don't really feel the need to have more points. I'm pretty happy with where we're at. I will say that the current 50% limitation on borrowing is a little bit restricting. So for our fall 2021 trip, we ended up needing <laughs> to purchase three one-time use points for about 60 bucks. I say need in quotes because obviously we could have just stayed at a slightly cheaper DVC resort, but we did want to do that one night at Beach Club, which was a little more points than somewhere like Boardwalk or Saratoga Springs or Old Key West, etc. Our next longer Disney World trip will probably be in fall 2023, and I'm guessing it will be in September again because that is the cheapest DVC season. Also outside of DVC and Walt Disney World, I just like traveling in September. I find it to be less crowded sort of everywhere, including the airports and, and everything. So I like September. It is still pretty hot in Florida in September, but you know, we'll make it work. Before that trip, we would have access to our entire 90 points from 2023, whatever we end up banking from 2022. Right now we have 45 points. I don't know if we'll end up using those for like a quick weekend trip or something, who knows. Um, and then we'll be able to borrow from our 2024 points, whether that's half of them or all of them. So I would think that, you know, 135 to 180 points, plus if we bank any from 2022, will be sufficient. With all that said, though, as soon as they announced the Disneyland DVC Tower, I had a very strong feeling in my gut that we would be buying there. So yes, I think the 90 points is sufficient, um, but I also know that there's a very high likelihood we'll be buying additional points for the Disneyland DVC Tower to get a home resort contract there. What are we going to do with all these additional points? I don't know if we'll rent them out. I don't know if we'll start staying in one bedrooms. I don't know. But I know that I want to live on the West Coast, and I know how hard it is to get those Grand Californian reservations if you don't have a home contract there. So we'll see what our finances are like, but we probably are buying more points specifically for Disneyland purposes. Next, I got a lot of questions about why I hate the Riviera Resort so much, essentially. I would argue I don't hate the resort. I hate the restrictions that they put on the contract as an owner. So while you own the contract, the points are normal, but if you ever want to resell it, the resale purchaser can only use those points at the Riviera. I find that to be extremely limiting, and I know that like I personally would never buy a resale contract at Riviera for that reason. It's too early to tell in the lifetime of the Riviera Resort how and or if that will affect the resale value. The resale value is a big deal to me and to Adam, probably more to me though, for purchasing Disney Vacation Club. And I think part of the reason it retains its value fairly well is the flexibility, which they have expressly taken away from those Riviera contracts. A lot of people have argued to me that like, you should plan on keeping the contract forever, so this shouldn't matter, blah, blah, blah. And like, yeah, sure, great. I'm glad that's how you feel. But I am not that old. I have a lot of health problems. And yes, I do have quite a large amount of savings, specifically in case medical issues come up. But in the American healthcare system, even like six grand won't necessarily cover things. So if something happens in my lifetime over the next 20, 30, 40 years, and I want to be able to pay it off real fast, I want to be able to flip a DVC contract. That's like the first thing I would get rid of, if we're being honest. It is so not necessary for our day-to-day -day lives. And also like, my car is worth nothing. I don't know what else I would sell, basically. This is, <laughs> this is it. So if I want to be able to flip a DVC contract for as much money as possible, I just don't want to be buying a contract that has these restrictions that may limit its resale value. The resort as a whole, I think is nice. I think it does fit very much in with the direction Disney has been going in terms of making things nice, but not super Disney. So to me, it feels like a Marriott, which is not a dig. I think Marriott's can be very lovely. And the artwork is great. That makes it more Disney, but like the architecture of the building itself and the interiors feels a little bland to me. And then personally, I also don't prefer that location for how much you're paying for it. I think it's a pretty expensive resort both in initial purchase price and in annual dues. Although we'll see how those grow over time. Maybe maybe they're not growing very much over time for the first 10, 15 years, which would help. But yeah, I mean, you're not walkable to any theme park. So it's just not, it. everyone has their own personal things. You're allowed to have your opinion. I'm allowed to have mine. Subjectively, it's just not for me. 
And then the last big question I also got a smattering of times from many individuals, some anonymous, was basically, you look kind of young, how the heck did you afford Disney Vacation Club? Many also pointed to the fact that we paid for it in cash and didn't finance, and that's like a lot of money, and you're not wrong. We'll do petty answers first, and then we'll get to the real answer. Petty answers are things like, Adam and I are both from cultural upbringings that are pretty frugal, so I'm from an Asian military family, and he's Jewish, so we coupon very hard, for example. We buy non-name brand things, not always, but almost always. When I'm buying gifts for other people or clothing items or other items for myself, I never pay full retail price. I plan to have my car until it dies and it's running perfectly well and it's over a decade old, so that might be a very long time. We mostly cook our meals. We don't really go out to eat hardly ever. And if we are getting takeout, we'll order it through them directly. Many of them will give like a 10% discount if you order through them instead of a third party service. And then we will go pick it up and ring it back. Like we don't pay for delivery fees. We pretty much never door dash or any of that stuff. There's a lot of little ways in our lives I think that we do choose to intentionally be a little cheap, a little frugal and save some money. I do still coupon, not as aggressively as I did in grad school because let me tell you, when you're living paycheck to paycheck, you find every 25 cents you can squeak out. <laughs> and thankfully we're way more financially comfortable than that now, so I don't coupon quite as hard, but I still try. I mean, it's definitely still a thing in my life. But obviously no amount of frugal living is going to magically create $14,000 in your bank account. That's just not how it works. So the real answer is generational wealth. Neither Adam and I had to pay for our college educations. Our parents financed that for us fully. Neither of us have any meaningful debt because of it. And since we don't have to pay off student loans, the amount of disposable income we have is far greater than that of our peers. We of course do both work very hard and I think we are rewarded for it in our salary. Adam's about a decade into his career. He gets paid pretty well. I am only a few years into my career, but I spent five years getting a PhD. So my initial salary was much higher than if you'd gotten a job straight out of your BA or BS. Both of our cars are paid off. We rent an apartment. We do not own a home. So we don't have a mortgage to pay. We obviously have to pay rent, but we don't have mortgage. We don't have homeowner association fees. We don't have house upkeep costs, you know, new roof, new heating, all that stuff. We also don't have kids. So we are double income, no kids. Some of these absolutely are lifestyle choices, and I do think that they help in terms of having disposable income to spend on frivolous things like Disney Vacation Club. But yeah, the big part is where our parents paid for our college and generally have been financially supportive of our lives. Not now that we're adults and we have, you know, proper income, but prior to that, yeah, we didn't have to take out these huge loans. We don't have to pay off the huge loans now. So that's kind of the whole answer. We were very lucky and we have that huge privilege that most people, particularly at least in our age group, don't. Of course, I think if you are penny pinching and saving, particularly like we did in a separate bank account so you don't see that money, you can create sums of money. It will happen eventually, but depending on your financial situation, it may take more than a couple years to save up enough to pay off a Disney Vacation Club contract in cash. And following that, I did get a couple of questions about why we did pay in cash and why didn't we finance the DVC purchase at all. And the short answer is, uh, depending on how you're able to finance, the interest rates can be very, very high. And it's a little bit horrifying how much you end up paying just towards interest. I did a whole video about that. If you want to learn more, you can click the link in the description below. If you're buying directly through Disney, you can put it on credit cards and such with no fees, I believe, I'm pretty sure. Um, so we could have done that and, you know, paid off the credit card over four, five, six months, whatever the allotted time is where it wasn't accruing interest, which is a benefit of the Disney Beast Chase Rewards credit card um, for Disney Vacation Club purchases and I think Disney Cruise Line, a few other Disney purchases. And then, you know, obviously many credit cards outside of the Disney credit card line will have promos where like transfer a balance here and get 24 months to pay it off or whatever. Um, but because we did it through the resale market, if you use a credit card, I think there's a pretty hefty fee. So it was just like, let's just pay in cash. You can finance again, that's totally up to you. But I think it diminishes a lot of the potential savings you get out of Disney Vacation Club. So I would rather save up. And because we have this privilege and we're able to save up pretty fast over just a couple of years, you know, I'd rather just save up, pay it off in cash rather than buy it when we didn't have the cash, finance it for a few years, and then it ends up taking another year and a half or whatever to pay off everything because the way the interest is accruing. My personal opinion is Disney Vacation Club certainly, and honestly, maybe even Disney parks in general are a luxury product. 
I do think there's a lot of research that support how important vacations are for your mental health and your overall well-being, but doesn't need to be a Disney vacation. Like many people also need a car in order to literally get to work, but you don't necessarily need a BMW. With the pricing of how Disney's going, certainly at least since I've been paying attention to it for the past five, six, seven years, it just feels like they're trying to corner that market of being more luxury, of being that thing that only wealthy people can do. I'm not on the board of directors, so I don't know how intentional this is, or I don't know if they've just been raising prices for parks in particular to assume that means less people will come, but a ton of people are still coming, so it's not working. I'm not sure what the motive is, but it definitely is incredibly expensive. There's no way of getting around that, and I fully own and recognize the privilege I have in being able to go regularly and do something like buy Disney Vacation Club. There are so many Americans that will never get to go to Disney World, much less have a freaking timeshare for it. And frankly, so much of that comes down to generational wealth and it's pretty unfair. And while I hate to end on that depressing note, that is the last question. So thank you again so much to everyone for submitting questions to me on YouTube or if you do it through Twitter or Instagram or to my email, I really appreciate your interactions. And I would also love to hear your answers to these questions. Feel free to answer any of them that you want to share in the comments down below. And while I've sort of made a habit of doing this on the birthday of the channel, if you have any questions, particularly logistical ones about Disney World, Disneyland, or Disney Vacation Club, you can shoot those to me at any time and I'll, I'll definitely get you an answer. Maybe not in video format, but I'll try to help you out as much as I can. I really appreciate you all being here and liking the videos and subscribing to the channel. It means so much to me. I hope the rest of your day is magical and we'll see you real soon at Pixie Dust PhD.